what is up youtube welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then just welcome to my channel go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed today's video is going to be a true crime and makeup video and if you are new here that is where i sit into my makeup and i tell the story of a true crime story yeah today's story is going to be a long long one this might be an hour video i don't know because so much so much has happened okay today's video is going to be about fred and mary west and uh we about to get into all the things that they did together child they were terrible they did a lot okay so the video is gonna be long and without further ado let's just get into it rosemary west was born rosemary letts in 1953 to parents bill and daisy her mother was described as very beautiful but also very shy and damaged she was prone to depression and she treated it with shock therapy and she did this before she got pregnant with rosemary and during her pregnancy as well so that might be why rosemary turned out to be a little cuckoo bill her father was said to be very charming he was a formal naval officer who was obsessed with cleanliness and he beat his wife and children for like any small infraction he was very very strict very overbearing and he is rumored to have sexually abused rosemary as a child he also suffered from schizophrenia so they had a lot going on it might not have just been the electric shock therapy that resulted in little rosemary being crazy rosemary began experimenting with her sexuality very early in her childhood which could be a result of her being sexually abused by her father her sexual abuse she took out on her brothers she raped one of them when she was 12 and as she got older she began to harass sexually harass the boys in the neighborhood as well i don't know if the boys in the neighborhood had an issue with it though little boys tend to be freaky now Frederick Walter West was born on September 29th in 1941. His parents, Walter West and Daisy Hill, their mothers had the same name. Two daisies bringing up crazies. Frederick's family was a poor family and they were very close knit. Their parents were mutually overprotective. Fred was the oldest of six children and he was seen as a mama's boy. Like him and his mother were very, very close, too close because at the age of 12, his mother sex began sexually molesting him. He also admits to, uh, per to have participated in bestiality, which if you don't know what that is, that's freaky acts with animals. His father also sexually molested his sisters. So he kind of grew up thinking that incest was normal because you know, his mama was touching on him and his daddy was getting the girls and it was just a whole, whole hot mess of incest. Y'all gotta excuse me because I've been watching battle raps lately and you know, your girl is really developing her skills. I might just drop a mixtape. In June of 1961, Fred's 13-year-old sister informed their mother that Fred had been raping her since the previous December and that she was now pregnant. Fred was then arrested and he was very open about his abuse. He, he really, really thought it was normal. Like he openly admitted to molesting the young girls for years now and he reportedly asked the officers like doesn't everybody do it like isn't this isn't this a thing and they were like sir it's not it's not supposed to be now daisy tried to pretend like she was so disgusted with her, with her son's actions and she just didn't support that she was outraged like so, girl you touching him what you mean you outraged she testified in his defense and then kitty for whatever reason refused to testify so the charges were dropped because there was literally nobody to be like he did this much of the family disowned him after this happened and he was forced by his mother to leave the house and move in with his aunt violet so by the next year he reconciled with his parents but most of the family still was not they weren't messing with him and so yeah they weren't fucking with fred okay in september of 1962 fred is now 21 he becomes reacquainted with a childhood friend her name is Catherine castillo castillo oh you watch uh american not american horse or what's that movie what's the show how to get away with murder castillo if you don't watch it, you won't get that. And if you do, I probably just still look crazy, but whatever, we're gonna keep going with it. Catherine is pregnant by an Asian man and her family is, has disowned her. They're like, 
we don't want no mixed breeds around here so they kick her out and she is just out here pregnant and alone and uh not for long because here comes fred they get married the only person that attends their wedding is fred's young brother john i don't even know why john was there but he was there or whatever the couple move in with aunt violet she and she is a gracious host and invites him and his wife and their well her unborn child into her home so sweet fred is working as a uh, ice cream truck driver when Catherine gives birth to her daughter charmaine who is mixed obviously half asian to explain the couple tells people that Catherine had suffered a miscarriage and they adopted little charmaine Girl, what kind of shit is that? Like, ain't that messed up? In July 1964, Catherine and Fred welcomed their daughter, Anna Marie West, into the world. She was born at home. They didn't even go to the hospital. They delivered her at the house. And, yeah, they were parents. But not very good parents because Fred, he was very overbearing, very controlling, very manipulative. He abused them. He kept the girls in a bunk bed and the bottom had bars on it and they were not allowed to leave the bunk bed without permission like they literally were caged throughout the day so the couple hires a nanny to help them care for the two girls and the nanny has a friend 16 year old Ann mcfall who hangs out at the house a, a lot the friend was going through a lot her boyfriend had died by like a workplace accident and she just she just needed to be around her friend and so the Wes did not have an issue with Anne hanging out there, so she was there all the time. Over a short amount of time, Fred became very, very, very dominant. Like, his abuse increased a lot, and um, Catherine was getting sick of that shit. He was controlling over the nanny, the wife, the children, little Anne. As if I was Anne, I'd be like, you know what, I'm going through enough, and I just would have packed my shit and left. But something weird was going on there, and we'll get to that. Catherine suffered the most of his fury. She began cheating on Fred, and she devised a plan with her lover to escape Fred's crazy domestic abuse. So Catherine got with her little side dude, and she came up with a plan for her and the nanny and Anne to all leave with the kids. But when it came down to it, that day they were supposed to leave, shit just hit the fan. It fell apart, like... You got to really be careful who you make plans with. Like escape plans, criminal plans, because they weren't solid at all. The day comes, homeboy shows up to take his boo and her kids to <laughs> bars. But Fred refuses to allow her to leave with the kids. He's literally physically holding on to the kids. He's like, you ain't going nowhere with my kids. It was a real Ike Turner situation. You know, when he came and got her out the bus, he grabbed the kids. But in this situation, Charmaine said, damn them kids. And she left. And then Anne was like, I'm not leaving. Like, she had, at this point, developed this weird infatuation with Fred. And she probably tipped him off and let him know that this was all going to go down. So the only people that ended up leaving in the end of this was Catherine, her man, and the damn nanny. She left the kids behind. And she was just like, I'll come back for you. I'll check on you. And she did. She checked on her kids to just ensure their safety. But I feel like that's some bullshit because you know they weren't safe, girl. They weren't safe when they were at the house with you and him. So with them being at the house with him alone, you know they're not safe. So now the girls are at the house with Fred and Anne, the nanny's friend, who's now infatuated with Fred. I know it's a lot, but just, just follow me. So fast forward to July 1967, Anne is now 18. She is still at the house with Fred and the girls, and she is now eight months pregnant by Fred, obviously. One day, she mysteriously vanishes, and she is not reported missing. She's just not heard from again or seen around the house. The kid's like... What happened to old girl and the baby on the way? Fred initially denied he had anything to do with Anne's disappearance, but he had confided in, confided into someone that he had stabbed her to death during an argument. And later on down the line, her body was found buried at the edge of a cornfield not far from the house. Her limbs had been removed and her unborn child had been cut from her womb. Her wrists have been found with sections of like uh, some kind of fabric wrapped around them, suggesting that she had been bound 
prior to her murder. So a month after that, Catherine returns to the house to check on her children. Catherine is convinced to come try to give their love another chance. She returns to the house with Fred and the girls and they're thinking that they could maybe work it out, maybe start over, but this did not work out. They um separated again a year later. She left again, leaving the kids in Fred's care. Now you remember Rosemary Letts, who I, you know, started the video telling you about sweet little Rosemary. No, she wasn't sweet. She was raping boys. What am I talking about? Anyway, they first meet in early 1969, shortly after Rosemary's 15th birthday. She is at a bus stop and Fred, who is now 27, is at the same bus stop looking for his stepdaughter, Charmaine. Now, from the moment that Fred laid eyes on 15-year-old little Rose, he was infatuated with her. He was like, that's my wife. That's going to be bae. Her, not so much. So he would show up at that same bus stop that he initially saw her for the next couple days, just really laying it on, trying to, you know, seduce old girl, trying to um, win her over. And after a couple days, it actually does. She becomes flattered with all the attention and effort that he's putting in to win her attraction and... Um, they become a thing. And he paints the picture that he is this sad, abandoned, great father and husband who's been left by his promiscuous, crazy wife with their two loving children. And Rose is eating that shit up. So within a couple weeks of meeting Fred, Rose decides she's gonna quit her little job down at the bread shop and be his nanny. He agreed to pay her what she was making there and, um, they had time to spend with each other. This was weird, but hey, if it wasn't, I wouldn't be here telling you this story. Now, in the meantime, her parents are thinking that she's still working at the bread shop, but after time, I guess Lil Rose got tired of lying, so she introduced Fred as her boyfriend, and because of the age difference, her parents were like, hell no. They were not trying to hear it, like they were not accepting of it. Although her family was very, very, very vocal about their disapproval of their relationship, the two were on their R. Kelly and Aaliyah shit and they did not care. They kept seeing each other and that was that. Fred was in love. He was infatuated with Rose. Whatever Rose wanted, he made it a point to get. The couple soon marry and move in together and she begins helping him with his eight-year-old, well now eight-year-old stepdaughter Charmaine, his daughter Anne Marie. And unfortunately, Lil Fred gets popped by the cops, goes to prison. At this time, Rose is 17 and she's the adult of the house. She's responsible for the kids. She did not like this. She was like, I came here for my man, not true girls. Now Charmaine had a little bit more rebelliousness in her. And so Rose really did not like that. She grew to really, really hate Charmaine. Like she was not here for Charmaine in her sassy mouth. And um, little Charmaine went missing for good in the summer of 1971. When Anna, her sister, and like neighbors and people who knew of Charmaine's presence would ask Rose about the girl, she would tell them that she had gone to live with her mother and she made it no secret that she was happy about it. Good riddance, the girl is gone. But in actuality, Rose had killed Charmaine. She had sent that girl to the upper room, put a return to send a label on it and sent homegirl back to her creator, okay? Shortly after that, Fred is released from prison and his release date was June 24th, 1971. Now Charmaine's body was initially stole in their coal cellar until Fred was released and he was like, you know what? We gotta get rid of this body. Like she can't just stay here. He buried her naked body in the backyard, not too far from where the door was. And uh, later autopsy revealed that several bones, her kneecaps, her fingers, wrist, toe, and ankle bones had all been chopped up, which is very weird. But I ain't here to make sense of it. I'm just here to tell you the story, okay? Now it's time for Catherine to come visit. So Catherine shows up looking for her baby girl and there's just one. She left two. Now, of course the couple cannot allow her to just leave with the information that one of her kids are missing. They couldn't tell her the same story that they told everybody else, which was that Charmaine had run off with Catherine because she was Catherine and she would have been like, she ain't run off with me. So um, now Catherine goes missing. She showed up at the house to confront Fred and she's never seen again. When her body was discovered, she was found to have been killed by strangulation. She had also been severely dismembered, placed into plastic bags, 
and buried near a cluster of trees in their backyard. And shortly after giving birth to their second child, they are now a poor little couple with three kids and struggling to make ends meet. Well, Rose decides she'll work as a prostitute out of their home. So she began advertising in a local neighborhood magazine, her services, and um, she had a bedroom in the house referred to as the Rose Room, which had like this little red light outside of it that if it was lit, you know, Rose was in there getting busy and you were not to disturb her. The room also had many hidden peepholes for Fred to watch. Yep. And it was also fully equipped with baby monitors for him to be able to hear when he wasn't around to, you know, see. The room was kind of, she was a professional little prostitute. She had like a mini bar. The room was nice. And uh, she actually held the key to the room on a necklace around her neck at all times. She was the only one that had a copy. Nobody was supposed to go into the Rose room unless they were getting serviced. They also installed a doorbell at the house that they used strictly for her male company. So they knew when somebody was at the door and they rang the doorbell, they were there to buy a little piece of ass from Rose nothing more and nothing less when the kids got older they actually used them to like help with the appointments set up the appointments walk the people up like it was a family business a weird weird family business in september 1972 eight-year-olds anna marie is brought by the couple down to the cellar where she is instructed to remove her clothing and when she is taken too long because she confused rose steps in snatches the clothing off the girl and then she's bound and gagged and tied to the bed fred sexually assaults her now mind you this is his daughter this is his blood daughter with Catherine. okay his blood daughter he sexually assaults her with Rose's active encouragement. Afterward, Rose tells Anna that this is what all fathers do to their little girls, that this is normal, but she isn't to talk about it. Like it's not something you talk about, but it is normal. And they let her know like she should expect it to continue. She was also threatened that she would be beat if they got word that she had divulged any of this to anybody. So she was very much afraid to speak about it to anyone. Rose herself would also sexually abuse Anna and she particularly took delight in like tying the girl up before Fred would come in and assault her. Like that was something that she enjoyed a lot. She made it very, very clear that she enjoyed it. She's very, very sick. Now this goes on for years unfortunately and at the age of 13 the couple decide that they want to force Anna to also participate in the prostitution that Rose had going on with her own vagina her clients were told that she was of the legal consenting age for sex and that she was a willing participant which was not the truth but Rose set in on all of her appointments to make sure she didn't like tell anybody her real age or like tell anybody she needed help and I just felt like I mean she just felt like it was something that she had to do really because she didn't see a way out so October 1972 the couple hire a nanny by the name of Caroline Owen she's 17 and uh, I don't know where they they getting this money to hire nannies and stuff oh forgot Rose is out here doing what she does. Fred tells the 17 year old that he is also a skilled abortionist and he will be more than willing to help her should she ever need his services. He would often talk about sex a lot as if he was you know obsessed. This made Caroline very very uncomfortable as it would make anybody who was in their right mind uncomfortable. He claimed that his women who he would perform these abortions on were so satisfied with his services and so pleased with his customer service that they would often offer him sexual services as a payment. And it's like, now correct me if I'm wrong because I've never, I haven't had an abortion before, but I don't think you would get up off abortion table and be like, especially one that's done in somebody's house and be like, all right, yeah, now let's do it. What? You just stuck a clothes hanger up my vagina to pull my baby out. Like, I think that's the last thing somebody would want to do. But hey, I don't know. That doesn't even make sense. But like I said, I don't make the news. I just report it, okay? Now, Caroline was uncomfortable by all of this, but what really broke 
the straw broke the straw the straw that broke the camel's back whatever you mean you you know what i mean the final straw there it goes there i goes girl i just really need to get it together nasty little fred makes a sexual advance toward caroline and she's like you know what that's enough i'm leaving this place i'm blowing this popsicle stand and i'm going back to my parents house because y'all weird y'all mad weird on the 6th of december 1972 the couple decides that they don't want to allow caroline to return home to her parents that wasn't that wasn't an option so they're like you know what we apologize they offer a ride and an apology and they're like you know it's we understand why you feel the way that you do and um unfortunately she uh, she accepts the ride she gets into the car fred is driving and rose gets into the back seat along with Caroline she said that she wanted to sit back there with her so they can have a girl's chat okay so Fred is up there driving the van and then get the wheels turning and their apology quickly goes from a we're sorry for being creeps to a uh, slip of a finger up Caroline's skirt from Rose Fred begins asking these weird creepy questions about whether or not Caroline had had sex with her boyfriend before and Caroline is like what is going on here when she demands that they pull over and let her out of the car they stop the car fred punches her until she becomes unconscious they cover her mouth up bind her and take her back to the house there once at the house she regains consciousness and they force her to drink this tea that is poisoned well it's not poisoned it's like it's like laced with drugs that are gonna make her kind of like woozy so after the tea she's gagged again she's taken into the cellar and the couple of course they start to sexually assault her so during the assault fred makes the comment that caroline's clitoris was unusual and this upset him so he took out a belt and he started to whip it i just felt strange even saying he began to lash her across you know her girl parts and when she began to cry out i'm sorry if this is graphic because it is kind of bad when she begins to cry out in pain he goes from that to smothering her with a pillow and at that time rose starts to perform fellatio on the girl and at that point she is just like she just stops fighting. The next morning, she is still there at the house and she is just there at the house. The couple is making all these weird threats to her. They're telling her that they're going to allow their black friends to come and sexually abuse and sodomize her if she does not stop screaming or if she doesn't, you know, not participate, but allow them to do what they want to do. They said that after they allowed this to happen to her, she would then be killed and buried and that they had done this to hundreds of girls before, and that it was nothing to do for them. So after this, they have a calm conversation with her where they're asking her if she would reconsider being their nanny. And she sees this as an opportunity to escape. She's like, if I agree to be their nanny, they won't kill me and then I'll be able to get up out of here at some point. Now she agrees and from there she goes to vacuum in the house, tending to the kids, doing the chores that she had been doing, you know, making everything seem normal. Later on that day, her and Rose decide that they were going to the laundromat to wash clothes and from there she is given the opportunity well, not given because Rose didn't give her the opportunity, but she finds the opportunity to escape and she's able to make it home to her parents' house. Now, initially, she was so ashamed to tell her parents what had happened to her, so she tried to pretend as if nothing had happened. However, comma, it wasn't long before her mother noticed these scars and welts and bruises all over her daughter's body and she questioned her about where they had come from caroline breaks down tells her the whole thing and caroline's mother goes to the police they are arrested immediately and charged with assault and bodily harm and of course you know the rape but by the trial date caroline had kind of began to move on with her life and she just wanted to put the whole thing behind her so she refused to attend the trial because she said that she just could not relive it. She just could not face them, which she would have had to do in order to testify in court. And because of this, all of the charges were dropped and the couple were only fined 50 euros, which is the equivalent of $55 and 29 cents American dollars. So yeah, upon finding this out, Caroline was just so 
distraught that she unfortunately attempted suicide but fortunately she didn't succeed so you know she made it out through the ordeal she did hopefully she's okay this day and not still suffering mentally because i'm sure sure that was a horrible thing to have lived through three months after the couple's trial they commit their first known murder the victim was 19 year old linda go yeah go like van gogh that kind of go was Van Gogh. I don't know how you spell Van Gogh. Maybe I shouldn't have said it was like Van Gogh, but it wasn't G-O, it was G-O-U-G-H. So the couple had added another hustle to their prostitution of Rose. They now rented rooms at their house to people who, you know, just needed a night, a place to stay for the night, or who needed a little extended stay service or whatever. On April 19th, Linda moves in as one of these people who just needs to, you know, rent for a while. They have other tenants at this time, but on the 20th, the next day, the couple tells the other people, like they casually mentioned that Linda was made to leave the house after she had hit one of their children. This story was repeated to Linda's mother and she contacts the West for an explanation. She's like, now what happened again? And where did my child go? And they tell her like, oh yeah, she hit our kids. So we just asked her to leave because we're non-violent. And she was very violent. And so the mother was like, she just wasn't believing it, but she really didn't have any other evidence. So none of the other tenants really thought it was that strange until they noticed that she was wearing Linda's shirt that she was wearing when she came in on the 19th. It's like, girl, where you get the shirt from? Now, when Linda's body was found, she was dismembered. Her jaw was completely covered in duct tape and adhesive. There were long sections of string and like fabric and knotted rope had been found with her body that was used, of course, to bind her. She had died from either strangulation or suffocation. Her dismembered body was missing five cervical vertebrae, which are neck bones. Her kneecaps were missing. Also numerous finger and toe bones. She was buried in the inspection pit beneath the garage. Now, on, on November 10th, 1973, 15-year-old Carol and Cooper, who lived in the Pines Children foster home. She was spending the evening with her boyfriend. She was a 15 year old girl and they went out to the movies. He walked her to the bus stop and that's where he left her, thinking his boo was just gonna, you know, catch the bus and go on home. Now, unfortunately, Fred and Mary were out on the prowl on this particular night and they spot her sitting at the bus stop. I know this looks weird, but this is for my lipstick to stick to the inside of my lips. So. so Fred and Mary pull up on 15 year old Carol and they toss her body into the car. Her face is bound with surgical tape. Her arms are bound with rope and she's driven to their home. Now at the West house, they have kind of formulated their cellar to cater to these weird sexual fantasies that they carried out on these unwilling participants okay she is suspended from the ceiling by her hands subjected to abuse and unfortunately murder she died from either strangulation or asphyxiation as with linda her body is dismembered the same and she's buried in the cellar in the ground underneath the house i feel like since i put this red on my red under my eye doesn't look so red anymore like it's looking pink. Y'all, I think this is the look and we only like halfway through the story, so we gonna make it work. So over the following 17 months, they commit four additional murders in their home together. Their victims range between the ages of 15 and 21 and they all suffer a similar fate to Linda and Carol, which is, you, you know their routine by now. Each victim being subject to a greater abuse and torture than the previous. So in April 1975, 18 year old Juanita Motz is hitchhiking and she is picked up by the couple. They abduct her, bring her back to their little house of horrors, okay? They assault her, they murder her, they bury her underneath the house in the cellar. And after her burial, I guess they ran out of space and they decided, you know what, we gotta make some changes. So Fred covers the ground, which he now has three bodies, three or four bodies. That's not the total that he's killed, mind you. Those are just the ones that he put down underneath the cellar. He concretes the entire floor of the cellar and reconstructs it to be the bedroom of his oldest children. Now, by 1977, you remember when they first got together, her parents, Rose's parents did not, they were not down with the union between Fred and, and Rose. In 1977, her father's kinda sorta kinda coming around. He still doesn't really like Fred like that. 
But he's trying to come around and make an effort because I guess he's like, you know what? They've been together this long. They're going to be together and it's nothing I can do about it. When Bill Letts discovered his daughter's prostitution business, what you think he did? He also began to visit and have sex with his daughter. He became a regular paying customer to have sex with his daughter. Like, what? So during this time, Rose becomes pregnant, right? 18 year old Shirley Robinson, she starts to rent a room from the couple and she's at the house with them. She was bisexual and she kind of was down with their little freaky flow. Like she would participate in casual sex with the couple. She also becomes pregnant and at eight months, she mysteriously vanishes from the house. Of course, she's pregnant by Fred. Her baby is due like within a matter of months. And unbeknownst to Shirley herself, Fred had made plans of selling their baby to a couple who couldn't conceive. He had actually like taken pictures with her, sent them to the other family and was like, I got you baby on the way. Now, initially Rose, who I said is pregnant herself, she would talk about the fact that Shirley was pregnant by her husband as if it wasn't a big deal like she would you know casually talk about it and then over time she became jealous and like resentful towards Shirley for being pregnant by her man. She started to see Fred's relationship with Shirley as a threat to her own union with Fred and she was like we need to get rid of this threat. The threat needs to be neutralized, okay? Homegirl gotta go. Shirley became their next victim. They completely dismembered her. They removed her baby from her body and then removed body parts from the baby like why the baby had several bones missing then they planted her planted her i was gonna say planted her because they put her in a garden they buried her and her baby in their garden so shortly thereafter rose submitted a claim in shirley's name for maternal benefits to social services but it didn't end up going through but she tried to get some money i don't know if she applied for a week or food stamps or what but she tried she was unsuccessful, but she tried. Terrible. When people began to ask what happened with Shirley, when they noticed, you know, she just wasn't around no more, the couple would tell people that she relocated to Germany with her father to have her baby. She's doing fine. She's happy and healthy. And all along, she's in the backyard buried like a fucking seed. In 1979, 16 year old Allison Chambers, she ran away from a group home she was living in. She met the Wests and they propositioned her to be their nanny. She moves in with them and she actually lived with them for a couple of weeks before they attacked and murdered her. She suffered the same fate as all their previous victims, sexually assaulted, cut up, buried, and lied about where she was. Now, in 1979, Anna Mae West, who is now 15, and she's been suffering at the hands of her parents' abuse since she was eight. This is the first one that they abused when they took her down to the basement, told her that this is what all people do to their children. No, it's not. Just the nasty ones. Heather and Mae West are now the oldest girls, and they become the focus of Fred's sexual abuse. And when the girls reach puberty, it really, like, he really turned up the ante. Fred spoke very openly about his abuse to his children around the house. He was very unapologetic, as if abusing them wasn't enough. He would taunt them and make crude, nasty comments and jokes about it, as if the shit was okay. He would justify his explanations by saying, I made you, I can do what I want with you. Like, no, typically you'd be like, I brought you in this world, I can take you out. Which, that ain't that good. But, sir. He would force his children to watch porn with him. He would force all of his children to watch porn with him. And he would openly tell them like his intentions were to impregnate Heather and May. Just trifling. Now Heather, May, and Steven were the oldest and they were very, very close in age. And they were very close. Like they called themselves the trio. They were very close, loved each other. They came up with a plan to avoid or like minimize their sexual abuse. They would always make sure that one was in the presence if like the dad called they were, if both of them would come running like okay what you want with her like they never would allow one of the three to be alone with fred they never would take showers when fred was home they never would remove any items of clothing if he was in the house period they were not trying to have no parts in his nastiness if one went to the restroom they would stand guard the door like ugh. Nothing children should have to do in their own home or anywhere, period, point blank. Stephen was also informed that when he became 17, he was expected to 
began to have sexual relations with his mother, Rose would let him know like, all right, when you turn 17, it's on and popping poo, and that is not okay. The girls, although both of them were very disturbed and very affected by their father's abuse, they dealt with it differently. May developed a mechanism where she would like disassociate just so she could tolerate his abuse. Heather, on the other hand, she was very disturbed and it affected her a lot more. And you can really tell in her actions, like she would bite her nails down till they bled. She had developed a lot of the classic symptoms that kids like show when they are being sexually abused. When she sat in chairs, she would just rock. She also was very, very nervous and visibly uncomfortable in the presence of males. Now this distressful behavior led Fred and Mary to believe that she was homosexual. Like they thought because she was uncomfortable in the presence of males, she didn't like males and that she was a lesbian and they didn't like this at all. They're so stupid, like, oh my goodness. This caused them to target her more than any of the other kids. They would taunt her about her sexuality. Well, the sexuality they put on her because she wasn't admittedly a lesbian. Now Heather did not complain about her abuse to any of her friends or anybody, but her friends did kind of notice like some of the bruises, just how, you know, her, her behaviors had changed over the years. And it was also noted by the school as well. They took notice to it too. And they expressed some concerns specifically because in gym, she did not want to take off her clothes and change her gym clothes. I mean, I didn't either. But girl, I was... I wasn't trying to participate for other reasons, girl. I ain't nobody come to school to exercise. I came here to learn. I did not come here to exercise, boo-boo. On one particular instance, she was forced to shower along with all the other girls. And that's when a lot of the students and the staff noticed, like, this might be a little bit worse than what we thought because she had so many bruises, so many scars that were at various stages of healing. So, you know, of course, that shows that this stuff has been going on over time. This isn't just one instance. She tried to blow it off and say it was because she was in a fight, but they were like, no. Nah. She had also confided in one of her friends that the scars came from the abuse of her parents, actually, and not fights with her siblings. People were very concerned. Also, Rose's sexual endeavors, you know, she was up there selling everything she got, okay? everything she got. She was up there selling it and word spread around town, of course. Heather confided to one of her friends that the rumors were actually true. And when this got back to her parents through the father of one of Heather's classmates, honey, they were upset. By 1983, Rose had given birth to eight children. Yes, eight, eight. That vagina was tired, baby. That uterus had to be tired. I'm tired. Three of them were <laughs> three of them were conceived by clients, black clients, right? And this ain't funny, but it is. So Fred willingly accepted all of these kids as his own because you know he was down with it anyway. Like he knew what was up and he knew the consequences. So he was just like, you know what, we just gone. They mine. When people would question, like, why yo, why them little kids over there a little darker? Or if the kids themselves questioned why they were darker than the other ones, he told them it was because his mother, his great grandmother, was a black woman. And somehow the melanin had skipped generations and just picked them three kids. Ridiculous. So by 1986, Heather had graduated school and she was just applying for jobs all over the place in hopes that she would land one and then she could move away and support herself. And so by 1987, there was one job that she really, really, really wanted. She was waiting to hear back from them and unfortunately, she did not get the job. When she got word that she did not get this job, she became very, very depressed. She was sobbing. May recounted later that that night Heather cried all night long like sobbing all night long she couldn't even sleep may said that by the next morning heather was back to her normal self which was not in a good state i mean she was just sitting at the house biting her nails rocking looking miserable which was the typical for heather and now on this particular day the kids leave for school and Heather is sitting there biting her nails, you know, just rocking in a chair, like I said. When they come home from school, Heather is not there. The parents tell them that Heather took the job and that she had left, which they knew she hadn't gotten the job because of what happened the day before. So they knew something was up, but they really, I mean, they couldn't prove it and they really couldn't do anything about it. Oh, now Rose didn't keep the same story with everybody because she ended up telling one of the neighbors that that day they had a 
hell of a row, which is like a fight. And they have their run away from home. Later, the kids are like, okay, why hasn't she contacted us? Why haven't we heard from her? And all this time she's been gone. The parents decided to come clean and tell the kids that she had actually run away with her lesbian lover and eloped. And that she, had, she wanted nothing to do with the family. And um, that's why they hadn't heard from her. Now, when May and Steven, the other two of the trio, suggested that they contact the police just to make sure Heather is okay, the parents were like, nope, we ain't calling the police. Don't do that. Fred told the kids that he'd been keeping the secret that Heather had been involved in credit card fraud from them to keep her good image in their eye. And um, it would be unwise to contact the police because then their sister, the beloved sister, would end up in jail. And they didn't want that to happen. They actually... Fred and Rose persuaded some unknown individual to make a phone call back to the house to pretend to be Heather and talk to May. And of course she knew, she knew that wasn't her sister, but after that they would, they ain't try that shit no more. They was like, all right, we just gonna leave it as is. So over the following years after Heather's disappearance, Fred would make comments when any of the kids did anything he didn't like. He would say, all right, now you're going to end up under the patio like Heather. And uh, the kids were like, say what now? Like, he would often say it a lot. At that point, he kind of didn't even care if they knew that they had done something to Heather. They were just like, you know what? We didn't got away with it now, so it is what it is. Now, in the yard where Heather is buried, they placed a pine table over like a picnic table. And then adjacent to that, they put a barbecue pit and they would have little gatherings and stuff, host family gatherings right on top of where Heather was actually buried because their parents are sick, okay? You're sick to have wanted to do something like this, but I ain't here to judge from her to tell the story. In May of 1992, Fred asked his 13-year-old daughter, Louise, to bring him something to drink to his bedroom. Rose was not home at the time, but shortly after she went to the bedroom, the kids heard her screaming, no, you know, stop, don't do this. Shortly after that, they see Fred leaving the room, and when they go, she's in pain, crying, sobbing. Fred had actually sexually assaulted her, sodomized her, and strangled her. And when Rose returned home, the young girl confided in her mother and told her that this had happened to her. Rose replied to her, oh, well, you were asking for it. Like, excuse me? How, girl? By bringing him some water? Let me tell you something. My mouth too smart to have done with, dealt with this. Like, <laughs> so over the following weeks, Louise, the 13-year-old, is sexually assaulted by her father on three more occasions, one of which... He filmed and Rose watched and then she followed her to the restroom, followed her hurt and bleeding daughter to the restroom, taunting her and saying, what do you expect? And just being a bitch about the whole thing. Like, girl, bitch, I don't expect this. Like, I don't know what I expected, but I know what I don't expect. And it's for y'all nasty ass and my parents to be doing this stuff to me. Like, ugh. several weeks later, Louise got enough courage to confide in somebody and tell them that this had happened to her, which was one of her friends and her friend's mother. The mother contacts the police for her. The police come and search the house and they confiscate 99 pornographic videos, a mixture of homemade and store-bought. Unfortunately, the police were not able to find the video that showed the rape of the 13 year old. She made a statement that he actually had been abusing her since she was 11, but this was the first time that he had just like fully penetrated her. All of the children were then placed into foster care immediately. All of them were examined and all of them had traces of abuse, both sexually and just like physically regular abuse. It was terrible. They all gave statements that they were abused by both the mother and father and that their mother particularly told them like, look, if you tell anybody, things will only get worse for you. They also told the police about Heather and how they would tell them frequently like, all right, ends up like Heather under the patio. And so this led to a search of the garden of the West home. I promise y'all like I'm almost done. We like 70% there. The police dug up the garden and also the cellar. They found the remains of Heather. They found the remains of eight other women. And in addition to those nine, the bodies of Charmaine and her mother, Catherine. By this time, this couple had been operating as a sadistic team for 25 fucking years. 25 years they had been doing this shit to people. Each victim, aside from the pregnant woman, Shirley, had been buried with their ball gags and their restraints and all of the evidence that they needed for that particular murder. Like, are you dumb? 
What are you done? One was completely mummified, like with duct tape. They had completely covered her with duct tape and cut two little holes and put straws in it for her to breathe through those that would allow her just enough just enough air to to live for a little while most of the others have been dismembered decapitated and one had been completely scalped now at first fred took the blame he was a ride or die okay he took the blame for all of the murders he said rose had nothing to do with it rose didn't know anything about it and she played dumb and when they told her that they found her daughter she played the role of a like grieving mother like oh my god not my baby <laughs> I just want my baby. A mess. Fred admitted to killing their daughter. He said that he had done so in a fit of rage. He strangled her and then he dismembered her body. He said that he tucked her away in the bathroom for a little while while he literally dug up her grave. He insisted that his wife had no knowledge of his murder of his daughter. He said that um, during the murder of her, of Heather, his wife was preoccupied with her clients. Now, despite Fred's insistence that homegirl had nothing to do with these murders, the police weren't buying it. They was like, you know what? Nah, homegirl was in on it too. Now, on April 20th, 1994, Rose was arrested for something completely different. She was arrested for the rape of an 11 year old girl and the physical abuse of an eight year old boy. She was questioned more like in depth about these murders, specifically the murder of Heather and Linda. And on April 25th, she was formally charged for Linda's murder. Now by May 6th, Fred and Mary were both charged with five counts of murder each with Mary simply saying, I'm innocent, I'm, I'm, I'm innocent, I didn't do this. By the time they went to court, june 30th the next month they had discovered many more bodies and so fred was charged with 11 counts of murder rose was only charged with 10. this day in court was the first time that the couple had seen each other since shit hit the fan pretty much rose completely ignored her husband's presence and when he got close enough he put his hand on his sh on her shoulder because you know he was still in love with her he had tried to take the rap and uh homegirl was just like <sighs> don't touch me like she did not she was visibly like disgusted she, at least she put on the front that she was visibly disgusted by her husband and she just did not want to be touched or bothered as the police attempted to remove fred from court after everything was over he like tried to get away from them just to get close to rose he was just like bae bae and she was just like she was not trying to hear it. she was just ignoring him she was not here for any of his shenanigans and she mm -mm. Just no loyalty. Fred would continuously write her letters. She would not answer. And as the months go by of him being held in prison, he becomes increasingly depressed. He really spiraled in his depression when he got worried that homegirl was playing him and that she was out here playing the role of a grie grieving mother and stepmother and that he was this monster and that she was saying she had this hatred for him. She couldn't believe that he did this. Like, he was like, we. Steven, the one, the, the one boy of the trio, and Anna Marie, his daughter with Catherine, they both visited him in prison and he would plead with them to like deliver a message to Rose that he loved her. But Rose never acknowledged his gestures like ever. Eventually he got fed up with being rejected. He was like, you know what? F you too, okay, Rose? He retracted his earlier confessions of him like being completely alone in these crimes and um he threw a lot of it on rose he actually painted her as the monster her as like the brains of the operation said this stuff was all her idea excluding the murder of ann mcfall which he had acted alone obviously because this was before she had come into the picture he said everybody else homegirl was in on and he actually put the death of ann mcfall on his first wife he said that Catherine killed her because she was jealous because homegirl was pregnant with his baby like no that's not what happened, sir. Don't lie. Because of his depression, Fred was initially placed on a very, very strict, very strict suicide watch, right? He was being checked on every 15 minutes. But after so much time went on, they kind of relaxed on that. And as uh, soon as he got the opportunity, he hung himself in his cell. He left a very interesting suicide note. Let me read it for you. To Rose West, Steve, and May. Well, Rose, it's your birthday on November 29th, 1994, and you will be 41 and still beautiful and still lovely, and I love you. We will always be in love. The most wonderful thing in my life was when I met you. Our love is so special to us. 
So love, keep your promises to me. You know what they are. Where we are put together forever and ever is up to you. We love Heather, both of us. I would love Charmaine to be with Heather and Rena. You will always be Mrs. West all over the world. Uh, sir, I hate to uh, burst your bubble, but I think I think Kim Kardashian pretty much is the Mrs. West known all over the world. But anyway, he would be so, so disappointed. That is important to me and you. Yeah, he would be very much disappointed. I haven't got you a present, but all I have is my life. I will give it to you, my darling. When you are ready to come to me, I will be waiting for you. At the bottom of the suicide note found in his cell was a drawing of a little tombstone. And um, he had written on it, in loving memory, Fred West, Rose West, rest in peace where no shadow falls. In perfect peace, he waits for Rose, his wife. Bro, you, you really want to be, <laughs> he really wanted to be, um, he was on his Romeo and Juliet shit tough. It didn't have the same effect because that shit ain't romantic at all. So after several weeks of being presented all this evidence, the jury unanimously gave her a guilty verdict for all 10 counts of murder. The judge gave Rose a life sentence in prison to which she is never allowed to be paroled. And um, to this day, she lives her life out in prison and she contests her innocence. And we it's like, girl, we know you. We know you did it. OK, so you can just stop. You're not getting out of jail. You're never going to be paroled, my girl. That is it for this story and this look. If you liked either or if you like both, give it a thumbs up. If you made it this far, because this video going to be long. If you made it this far, you might as well just go and give me a thumbs up because obviously you liked it. OK, thank you so much for watching as always. And I will see you in the next one. Peace. Ugh, my mouth is dry. Drier than a nun's vagina.